Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Amen. I think the clergy are coming back, but I think I'll start anyway. Much as I am honoured to have been invited to St. Mary's this evening, I am conscious of quite a few incongruities and even ironies about it. The first is that it's considerably less problematic for you as Anglicans to invite me, a Roman Catholic, to join you as you reflect and adore the Blessed Sacrament than it would be if you were confecting and consuming it. And that is surely ironic. Because regardless of how beautiful and consoling it may be to spend time in Eucharistic devotion, the Eucharist is surely more an event and an experience than it is a thing. And so the normative mode of engaging with it surely is to celebrate and eat and drink rather than to merely look. There is an element of second best about adoration separated from participation in Holy Communion. Of course, the main reason for it being less problematic to have a Roman Catholic joining you at Evensong rather than at the Eucharistic Liturgy itself is the Roman Catholic Church's view that Anglicanism has not, in the words of Vatican II, retained the proper reality of the Eucharistic mystery in its fullness because of its view of your ordained ministry. Much has been done, particularly since Vatican II, to examine those blunt rejections and to grow in understanding and mutuality. But they remain a wound, and it's a wound that I'm very conscious of and can't help picking and scratching at this evening, coming here as a warmly invited guest, a little bit embarrassed by the elephant in the room. There is still much work to be done before it would be fully unproblematic to come not only as preacher, but as full communicant participant at Sunday High Mass. But for now, it's wonderful to be here for Evensong. As I struggled with the difficulties of our relationships as separated churches, I was drawn to look at the work of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, or ARCHIC, not realizing until I arrived here that uh, the real forerunner, uh, Lord Halifax, was a church warden here for many years. I only discovered that a few hours ago. But Archic has been working for more than 50 years now. And it's interesting to note that its first two pieces of work were on Eucharistic doctrine and ministry and ordination. There's nothing like getting stuck into the thorny questions first. I was very struck by how short the document on the Eucharist was. Just three pages, in fact. Maybe in those heady days after Vatican II in the late 1960s, when the young were revolting all over Europe in every sense of the word, they hoped that things would be solved quickly. How wrong they were. The great sacrament of unity is often, in fact, a sign of division, not only between our churches, but also sometimes within them, too. Another irony that hovers over this pulpit this evening. Nevertheless, that document did manage to say lots of very important things, such as the identity of the church as the body of Christ is both expressed and effectively proclaimed by its being centered in and partaking of his body and blood. In the whole action of the Eucharist and in and by his sacramental presence given through bread and wine, the crucified and risen Lord, according to his promise, offered himself to his people. That's what our churches were able to say together 50 years ago. Of course, Anglican participants in these kinds of dialogues have to be very attentive to their historical formularies and to strive to reflect the views of all parts of the church, not just uh, the part in which they happen to live and worship. And so that first document also addressed very briefly, uh, but pithily, I think, more contested issues like the concept of the Eucharist as sacrifice. Now, I somehow doubt very much if the language of the sacrifice of the Mass created much difficulty for the people of St. Mary's then or since, but it clearly is an important dimension of our inherited separation. 
Speaking of that inherited separation, here too there is an irony about our gathering tonight, one which I hope that I won't be considered rude for mentioning, and I do so with uh, affection and a little bit of mischief, I guess. The very feast of Corpus Christi itself and the solemnity and splendor with which you celebrate it, and I was at the rehearsal, so I know from what I'm talking about, the <laughs> splendor with which you celebrate it here is probably not what the Edwardian and Elizabethan reformers had in mind for the Church of England. <laughs> the sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance, lift, uh, what was it, reserved, carried about, lifted up, or worshiped, say the articles. And it most certainly is reserved here, and in a few moments, it will be carried, up, carried about, lifted up, and worshipped. There are no circumlocutions like Day of Thanksgiving for the institution of Holy Communion in this particular church. I should add, lest that sounds snide, that uh, although the new title for the festival is a little bit laboured, uh, if it makes the riches of this festival attractive in parts of the church where it was previously anathema, then I would suggest it is to be welcomed. You clearly have no such inhibitions here, and you celebrate this festival with joy and devotion, and indeed with a degree of fun, I think. But of course, there are risks in doing this. Occasions that are especially dear to Anglo-Catholics, such as May devotions and Corpus Christi processions, can easily become uh, occasions of unhealthy pride, or perhaps of a factional party spirit. There's always a place for bearing witness, and having the confidence to do so is wonderful and necessary. But we do need to be careful that it truly is the Lord Jesus whom we worship, and not merely our traditions or our tribe. But even when our motives are pure, it strikes me that perhaps the reformers might not have been entirely wrong to be skeptical about Eucharistic adoration, and I realize that I may be the only person here who can safely say this. Caught up as we can be in the loving presence of the one who promised to be with us always, and whose words are true, it can be tempting to luxuriate or even wallow in that presence, to want to enjoy our encounter with love for ourselves and ourselves only, to want to build three tabernacles and stay there as the disciples might have done on Tabor. Getting back to the sense of the word tabernacle in which we usually use it now, we would do well to attend again to the words of Bishop Frank Weston. There is a danger of regarding Christ as so entirely external to ourselves that we come to think of him as accessible only at the tabernacle. There is a danger of confining Christ's activity to the sacrament, to the exclusion of his reign and rule within the church. We cannot forget that the Lord Jesus sent the apostles back down the mountain, consoled and strengthened for the royal road to Calvary. And we cannot stay on Mount Tabor either. As we will do shortly, we worship, we adore, we savor, we delight, not for our own purposes alone, but so that we may enter ever more deeply and more powerfully into the mystery of the Eucharist, a mystery that is not just about presence, but about transformation, action, and service too. These more well-known words from the same Bishop Weston still ring true. I say to you, and I say to you with all the earnestness that I have, that if you are prepared to fight for the right of adoring Jesus in his blessed sacrament, then you have got to come out from before your tabernacle and walk with Christ mystically present to you out into the streets of this country and find the same Jesus in the people of your cities and your villages. You cannot claim to worship Jesus in the tabernacle if you do not pity Jesus in the slum. Just as they didn't quite get it at the Transfiguration, the disciples were also a little bit slow to catch on at the Ascension. I always sense sort of incredulous exasperation in the words of the white apparelled men, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? It's as if they're saying, stop staring and get on with it. You're his presence in the world now, so make that presence felt. 
be Christ for the world now. We can find echoes, I suggest, of these musings about the frequent slow-wittedness of the Lord's followers in this evening's first lesson, a short text that may have seemed uh, charming and even innocuous at first look. The divine is spoken of in feminine terms as wisdom, a gracious hostess who invites everyone in to her banquet. She has built her house. There are seven pillars, a number that signifies perfection, completion, and rest. She sends out messengers to the highways and byways, extending invitations in her name, calling on people to divert from their paths and turn into her house to eat of her bread and drink of the wine she has mixed. It speaks of the generosity and abundance that is associated with the Feast of Life. What did you notice? While the text characterizes God as a bountiful Lady Wisdom, it characterizes those invited to the feast in slightly less flattering terms, as simple and wanting understanding. Thick. Not exactly the most flattering description of the holy people of God. But the passage isn't just some irascible old prophet telling us how dreadful we are and that we're doomed. It's poetic language, presenting to us what God wants for us, God, who is perfect wisdom, wants to draw us closer. God wants us to lay aside all that limits us, to broaden our vision, to lay aside all that is not divine and life-giving, so that we too can be not slow-witted, but live in perfect wisdom and maturity. In inviting us to lay aside simple-mindedness and immaturity, the God of wisdom is inviting us to become wisdom ourselves. But God does not intrude or force, but rather invites. So let us not only worship him with genuflections and incense, let us learn from him and make him known and loved not only by our words, but by our witness. So will we come to share in the divinity of him who came to share in our humanity. As George MacLeod of Iona prayed, we are your body, nearer are you than breathing, closer than hands and feet. Ours are the eyes with which you in the mystery look out in compassion on the world. Take us outside the camp, Lord, outside holiness, out to where the soldiers gamble and the thieves curse and the nations clash at the crossroads of the earth so will our Eucharistic adoration and devotion bear fruit. I close paraphrasing St. Augustine, and I hope he will forgive me. If you, therefore, are Christ's body and members, it is your own mystery that is carried in procession through this assembly. It is your own mystery that you are honoring. You are saying amen to what you are. That response is a personal signature affirming your faith. Be a member of Christ's body then, so that your amen may ring true. Amen.